us last week, we're going to be looking at part two of our roadmap for 2019 and getting a little bit more in depth this morning as we look at part two. But let me ask this question, how many a week ago, or maybe just a few days ago, got into a fit of optimism and you made some great New Year's resolutions for 2019? How many of promises for this upcoming year? I see a lot of head shaking though, and then I'm going down that road again. Because the next sentence will make a lot of sense. Most of us abandon all of our resolutions before we get halfway through July anyway, or actually halfway through January. Um, if I wanted you to be really honest, some of you may be in 2018 dietary resolutions. How many kept to your diet for the whole year? Okay. Yeah, Tom, I don't believe you for a minute. <laughs> Some of you made resolutions as far as exercising. How many of you even completed that through the month of February? <laughs> I, you know what I'm doing with all this, don't you? Well, this year I was determined to make a resolution I knew I could keep and not disappoint myself. In fact, I decided I'm going to keep this resolution even if it kills me, and it probably will. I decided to eat more and exercise less. <laughs> Anybody with me on that one? Yeah, it was a good show of hands. But seriously, this morning I want to talk to you about some resolutions that actually flow from God's Word. And I would suggest to you that if we could embrace these resolutions, it would radically make a difference in our lives. There are four commitments I'm going to share this morning that really God would like to place upon our hearts, and I hope that we'll take hold of them. I know that as we listen to these resolutions, even myself, it could be a struggle. But with God's grace, they are possible. So listen to me and let the Holy Spirit speak into your lives as we walk down this road this morning at these four commitments that we need to take hold of. Number one, don't dwell on your failures. Now that sounds good. I mean, I think we're all in agreement. We don't want to be dwelling on our past. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3, 13 through 14. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it. Others that I haven't arrived. I'm not perfect. There's a lot of things I still need to work on. But he says, I focus on this one thing forgetting the past, and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Man, that is great advice. It's sound advice. And you know that that particular <laughs> advice from God's word has stood the test of time? I don't know anything more relevant or practical that could be said to us as we are now here in 2019. We don't have to live our lives imprisoned to the past. Now, we would agree that we all have failed in some way or another, haven't we? Fortunately for us, unless you do it on purpose, our failures aren't put on television or YouTube or social media. Now, some of you probably take joy in doing that, but for the most part, anything that we've done for failures really reside in our hearts and in our own minds. For many of us, our failures are painful memories. Perhaps the failure of a relationship, a decision that you made, or words that you shared, or things that you did that were wrong that severed a relationship. Some of us here in this room that are parents probably realize that we may have failed our own children. We really didn't do what we should have done or knew that we could have done. And it's very likely that uh, we're beating ourselves up because we failed in our own expectations. We failed in what we thought we should be doing or where we should be at this time of year. But you know, at times we all have failed God, haven't we? And yet God's word, spoken through the Apostle Paul, is saying, don't allow yourselves to be bogged down by your failures. Don't dwell, them on, or don't dwell on them so much that they end up actually handcuffing you and keeping you from moving forward. 
understand that God still has a plan and a design for you. And so I think as we're here now into the new year, it's a good time for us to rise to that challenge. You and I need to say, I am not going to, with the help of the Lord, fall into the same pattern again. In fact, with God's help, I'm going to ask for forgiveness in regards to my past. I'm going to make restitution where restitution is called for, and then I'm going to let go of everything else. I'm going to stop torturing myself by what I did or didn't do. You know, it's a good time in this new year to stop being chained to our failures. God is actually saying here in this word that you don't have to go through your life branding yourself as a failure. Jesus Christ died on that crude cross of Calvary so that you and I can be forgiven. When we receive Christ in the fullness of his forgiveness, it does allow us to forgive ourselves and to forget our failures. But then I want to take this a step deeper. We need to learn to let go of the past and those failures. But also we need to give up our grudges. Why don't you to listen to these words from the book of Colossians because in them, you're going to hear the second challenge I believe God wants us to rise to that will make this coming year, the year we're in, one of the best years of your life. Colossians 3.13 Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. God's challenge in those words is personal and it's direct. It tells us that we need to give up any animosity, bitterness, resentment, grudges that we may be holding against another person. That's what he means when he says forgive each other whatever quarrels you may have against one another. Let me explain what a grudge is. It's a deep, ongoing resentment that we enjoy cultivating in our hearts against someone. A grudge is an unforgiving spirit that leads to unforgiving attitudes and also unforgiving actions. Harboring a grudge is really nursing a dislike for someone. And what you need to know is that grudges are extremely dangerous and destructive. Grudges have destroyed marriages. Grudges have destroyed families. Grudges have destroyed friendships. And you want something else? Grudges have also split and ruined churches. The greatest problem often within a church isn't what is outside. It's the faction, the imploding that happens from within. When Christians hold grudges against one another, I think of George Stevens, years ago, who was doing a tent meeting revival. How many remember tent meeting revivals? Did they ever have them here in the Blacksburg area? Well, my wife and I had the privilege of being at several of them. We weren't the speakers, but we attended. But they put up this huge tent, and the whole community was invited. All the pastors in the community, their congregations, anyone else. But in this particular tent meeting revival that George Stevens was having, he was to be there for 14 days. Three days in, he wanted to quit. He preached his heart out and no movement whatsoever. It was one of the coldest, least receptive ministries he ever had. And he was getting ready to tell the pastors that put all this together, you can forget it. I don't know what's going on in this community. I don't know what's going on in your local churches. But God's spirit's not in this place. But on that third night, before he was ready to throw in the hat, the Lord directed his heart to Joshua chapter 7. In Joshua chapter 7, God actually judged the entire nation of Israel because of the sin of one man, Achan. God said, my people have sinned. And as he was in this message preaching it, one lady stood up by the name of Sue Johnson. Sue Johnson and another lady right there at that tent meeting had been best of friends. But Sue 
was hurt by something her friend did and held a grudge against her. And that grudge festered where she didn't want anything more to do with this one that she actually had a very close friendship with. When Sue Johnson was on the platform, she made sure her friend was in the congregation. If her friend was on the platform, she would be in the congregation because she didn't want to sit anywhere near this person she had a grudge against. Although they still attended the same church, and although at one time they were best of friends. But right in the middle of that sermon, Sue Johnson stood up, tears in her eyes, broken heart, and she says, I gotta get right with God. And she walked over to her friend, grabbed her by the arm, and said, Would you possibly, can you possibly forgive me? And together they went to the altar, poured out their hearts and prayed and asked God to bring restoration in that relationship. But while they were at the altar, a teenage boy stood up, turned to his mom and dad who were there in that tent meeting, and said, Mom and Dad, if you knew the hatred I had towards you, if you knew the things I said about you at school and other places, you would literally disown me as your child. And I got to get right with God. And this young man and his parents came to the altar and just wept and prayed as that young man let go of his grudges, let go of that which was ripping his heart. But believe it or not, even a pastor stood up, turned to those that were in that meeting that he served as their leader, and said, you know what, I need to get right with God and get right with some of my people. Because there's some of you in here I actually have learned to hate. Because of the way you've treated others, the way you've treated me, I've had this resentment inside that's just been boiling and burning. And I've got to get right with God. And he and some of his congregation went to the altar and prayed through. That service went late into the night. As one by one, people began to let go of their grudges and find God bringing tremendous healing. You know? This morning, if you're holding a grudge against anyone, I don't know if that's the case or not. But if you are, God's word has something to say. Simply this, give it up. Let it go. Let it go. And I want to remind you that grudges are not just destructive to those around you. Grudges are also self-destructive. When you hold a grudge against someone, do you know it's hurting you far more than it's hurting anyone else? Make no mistake about it, if you're harboring a grudge, it will eventually destroy you. Maybe not physically, but it's going to ruin you emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. <coughs> you will soon become a bitter and twisted person. In the book of Job, chapter 21, it describes people, and let me quote, who have no happiness at all. They live and die with bitter hearts. My, I don't want that to be the epitaph when I die. I don't want everybody looking at my coffin and saying, that was some ugly person. I mean, I know why I love me. <laughs> I'm talking about personality. <laughs> that, that that was a crude and resentful and bitter person. I don't think any of us want that to be said as we leave this planet. One, like we put it, Unforgiveness is like drinking poison, yet expecting the other person to die. God says in his word, don't sentence yourself to this kind of prison. Set yourself free. Give up your grudges. Forgive each other whatever you may have against one another. Notice what God is not saying here. He isn't asking you to ignore whatever that person has done to you. He isn't not even asking for you to pretend it never happened. He doesn't ask you to condone the behavior or act as if it doesn't matter. What God asks of you to do is to forgive the grievance. Don't let the hurt and the pain turn into bitterness and resentment. Let it go. And here's the part you're going to want to throw your hymn books at. Don't tell God you can't forgive. Because when you say that, what you're actually saying is, I don't want to forgive. I want to nurse this. 
I want to cultivate it. I want to hold on. I have a right to hold on to it. My friends, if Christ can forgive you and I, while we were yet sinners, his enemies, if he can forgive you and I, despite the fact it cost him his very life upon a cross, you and I then have the power through him to forgive someone else. And that brings me to the third commitment or resolution. Work at restoring relationships. Romans 12, 18 says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. In other words, the Lord wants you to work very diligently at restoring relationships. Now understand, there are some people that purposely and intentionally hurt you. You don't need to hang around those kind of people. That's not what this verse is saying. There's some people that even though you may want to restore the relationship, they can care less. In fact, the harder you try to restore it, the worse they're going to treat you. At that point, shake the dust off your, your feet and move on. That's what you need to do. However, there are times when we know that we're the ones that cause the hurt in the relationship. We're the ones that have caused the rift. If that's the case, then we do have a responsibility to do everything that we know of to bring restoration. If it be possible, as the King James puts this verse, then you need to make it right. And that everything includes the one thing that you and I probably struggle at the most, and that is to swallow our pride and literally say, and I mean say it with intent and passion, I am sorry. I wonder how many relationships would be restored today that would be much better, or could be much better, if one just had the humility to simply say, I was wrong, I am sorry, will you forgive me? And I'm certain that some of us need to ask for forgiveness for harsh words and cutting remarks that we have said where we've ruined others with our words, our attitudes, and our actions. And that brings me to the final point. And I say it at last because I want to be fresh in your minds. Turn away from your sinful patterns. You know, I read an interesting story about the Civil War. When the Civil War came to a conclusion, and all the slaves were now rendered free, a lot of slaves remained with their masters obeying every command that the master gave, even going through some very harsh treatment. In other words, although they were free, they continued to live as slaves. The New Testament says that that's exactly how many Christians choose to live. Christ died to set us free. The Holy Spirit has given us power to live this kind of life. But just like those former slaves, many Christians still choose to obey their old master and stay a slave to sin. Romans 6.12 says this, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. When God says for us not to let sin control the way we live, and not to get into its evil desires, he's really issuing a challenge that says this, Turn around, make an about face, and head in a different direction. Christian writers of old used to talk about something called, and I quote, besetting sins. How many ever heard that expression before? Besetting sins. Well, what's meant by besetting sins? Well, actually, it's that particular sin that a Christian is prone to commit time and time again. For most of us here, when we received Jesus Christ, our personal Savior, He gave us a new heart. He gave us a new mind. <clears throat> and a lot of things that we once did, it was easy for us to turn about face and let go. But then there's always that one or two things that we know are wrong that constantly hang us up, that constantly beset us, that we constantly battle with. So I ask this question, not just of you today, but every question is posed at my own heart as I stand before you. Is our spiritual life crippled because we have learned to live with a besetting sin? 
If you were to talk to my wife, it took me a long time to deal with this sin of temper. I had a horrible temper. She has tempered my temper. The frying pan, the rolling pan, a few other things that come into play. But maybe you have a, a temper that you constantly get into. You have to turn that over to the Lord. Or maybe you have a tongue that loves to assassinate other people's character and wound their feelings. You need to give that to the Lord. You need to surrender your tongue to Him. Or maybe you've learned to live with a critical, judgmental attitude that you know is wrong, but for some reason, you, you just still harbor that in your heart. It could be a host of sins. I can't even name them all this morning. But that one thing that you just won't give up, you continually battle with your besetting sin. God's Word challenges us to stop letting it control the way we live. Stop letting it get into the habit of our life and stop obeying your old master. You know, Jesus' death on the cross broke the power of sin. And the Holy Spirit that is now within us, the Spirit that's our guide, the Spirit who gives us direction, gives us also the power to resist sin. It says in James, submit yourself unto the Lord, resist the devil, we have the power to do that, and he will flee from us. That means we don't have to continue in this new year of 2019 still being defeated by the same old sin. You and I, nail this down, can have victory over it. We can. God says you're no longer a slave to sin, so don't live like one and don't act like one. If you will ask God for forgiveness for your sins and for the power to resist sin, then this new year can be not only just a new heir in history, but a new heir in your spiritual life. I would ask the praise team if they come back to the platform right now. Because it kind of boils down to this. Will this new year just be another calendar changing event in your life? Or are you willing to rise to these four challenges from God's Word? Right now, will you have the courage to forgive yourself and to let go of the past? Will you have the courage to forgive others who have hurt you? Forgive whatever grievance that you have held on to, the grudges that you have held on to? Do you have the courage to ask for forgiveness from those that you have hurt? And do whatever is in your power to restore these relationships? And do you have the courage to ask God himself for his forgiveness so you no longer have to be a slave to sin? but truly set free. As we stand together and sing our closing song, the altar is open. If God has spoken on any one of those points, and we just want to surrender those to him, we invite you to come to the altar as we sing.